Hello everyone, and welcome to Fanfic TV. So we are back with an interesting series on what Naruto was a golden lucky prince the son of gods and goddesses. But before we start, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button if you enjoy my content. Let's start the story. If Naruto Namikaze were to describe his life, he would say that it was an experience. The blonde teen was born in the rural areas of Japan and had spent a few years there before his father had gotten a job in America. The duo had moved to the other side of the world. And to say that Naruto was nervous was an understatement, he had left all his friends behind and was moving to a country where he didn't even speak their language, but he had held back on his insecurities for his father's sake. The man had needed this more than he would bear to admit. He had grown up in the small village of Konoha where Naruto was born and it was there that he had met the love of his life, Kashina Uzumaki. The fiery-tempered woman had swiftly stolen his heart and for a short time, he was truly happy. They had only spent a few months together before he had decided to pop the question and was exuberant when the woman had accepted. Minato could truly say that he would never feel the same for another woman the way he felt for Kashina so it was no surprise that when the woman had died giving birth to their only son, the man had fell into depression, it was only through the intervention of his closest friends that the man was even able to look at his son again. So it was for his sake that Naruto decided to face this new adventure with a smile on his face and his head held high. That had been six years ago and the now 15-year-old was wondering if that decision had been the right one. The reason being was the fact that he was pinned down by a dog the size of a small truck. He blinked before rubbing his eyes and blinked again. Yep, it was still there and he wasn't hallucinating. Now, in the back of his mind he felt the tiniest of voices telling him that there was no way that this could be real and he was dreaming, but the hot breath of death that washed over him every time the beast exhaled said differently. He flinched when a massive black paw stamped the ground beside his head and the thing growled and opened his massive jaws. Blood-red eyes seemed to shine with desire as drool leaked from the corners of its mouth and stained his orange shirt. Offhandedly, he wondered how the hell all the other people walking past him chose not to react to the fact that he was about to become the chew toy of a massive black dog. It was preposterous. And even worse, a blonde girl had passed, cooing about how cute it was seeing the boy playing with his poodle. Just what the hell was she seeing? Turning his attention back to the black beast, Naruto tried his best to steady his thumping heart rate. Panicking now would do him no good. Taking a moment to observe his situation, he realized how bad it really looked for him. He had been bowled over, laying flat on his back with the roided out dog above him, trapping him beneath its body. Good doggy, he stuttered out, feeling the blood drain from his face the closer its mouth came to his face. He could smell its breath and was trying his best not to gag in disgust. You wouldn't want to eat me. I'll give you indigestion. He tried to plead to the dog and was slightly surprised when he saw the beast tilt his head as if taking his words into consideration. Feeling a tad bit braver, he propped himself up on his elbows and grinned. That's right, if you eat me. You'll have a stomachache for months, he bluffed, while slowly edging himself out from under the dog. He had almost made it when the dog's head suddenly shot up and glared at him. It snarled and it was then Naruto realized that the dog had made up its mind whether or not he would make mince meat out of him. And Naruto didn't like his chances. So when the dog raised his paw to rip into his chest, Naruto spun out from beneath it and shot to his feet. He needed no prompting as he sped off in the opposite direction from where he had came. If he had known that a simple walk in the park would lead to a fight with what he had dubbed the hound from hell, he would have stayed indoors like his father had asked him. He hopped over a stray root as he plunged deeper into the woods that surrounded the park. He could feel the small tremors as the dog bounded after him. He dodged to the left and made a sharp turn and let out a small smile as he realized the dog had been tricked with his maneuver. He knew it wasn't enough to shake the monster off his tail but it had given him a few more seconds between the two and he would accept any small blessings he could get. Soon enough he could hear the monster giving chase again albeit further away this time. He frowned. He couldn't keep this up forever. He didn't know how much stamina the monster had but he could bet it was more than his. He would tire soon enough and then it would be all over. If he wanted to get out off this alive, he needed a plan and he needed to act now while he still had energy. The monster was closing the gap and would have bitten into him if it hadn't left out a howl of pain. 
Naruto heard its roar which was soon followed by a loud thud. He slowed to a stop and turned to see three arrows embedded into its neck while the dog dissolved into dust and was scattered into the wind. On the alert for company, Naruto tensed when two boys walked out of the woods. The first had short cropped brown hair and dark eyes. His mouth was set into a scowl so intense Naruto couldn't imagine the boy with any other expression. He was muscular, and would have been a bit more intimidating if he wasn't. So short. Hell, the boy barely reached his chin. He wore a pair of rugged jeans and an orange shirt with a picture of a horse with wings. A pegasus, Naruto mentally corrected himself. Walking slightly behind him was someone who would have passed for his brother. The boy had blonde hair and bright blue eyes identical to Naruto's. He was about the same height as Naruto, possibly a inch or two taller. He walked forward with an easy smile and a bow in his hand. He stopped at the area where the dog had died and crouched to pick up the three arrows before he placed them in the quiver strapped to his back. You okay over there, he called out to Naruto as he stood back up and dusted his pants. His smile had yet to slip and Naruto felt at ease in his presence. He approached Naruto and held his arm out which Naruto quickly grabbed and shook. Yeah, I'm good, Naruto answered before he looked over the boy's shoulders, thanks for the help and all but can someone tell me. What the hell is going on? The shorter boy took this as his cue to pipe up as he make himself known with a grunt. I told you we shouldn't have wasted our time. With this guy, he obviously isn't worth it, the boy huffed as he looked Naruto up and down. Shut it David. The blonde barked at the now identified David. In response, the boy only grunted before turning around. Before he left, he shouted a half-hearted goodbye then he vanished into the woods. The blonde stranger only sighed, as though this wasn't the first time the boy had walked off into the woods on his own. Forgive him, he gets it from his father. The name's Tyler by the way. Tyler Hemmings, what's your name? I'm Naruto Uzumaki and thanks again for the save, Naruto said. But can you please explain to me what the hell was that thing? He asked again but was ignored as Tyler turned on his heels and began to walk in the direction that David had left, as he reached the tree line, he stopped and faced Naruto again with his brow raised. You want some answers right? So, come on. Tyler motioned for Naruto to follow before he slipped into the woods. Naruto bounded after him soon after, not wanting to be alone if there were more of these monsters about. He caught sight of Tyler and jogged to reach his side. Pulling up beside him, he glanced at the arrows in the quiver and noticed that their tips were bronze, something he found odd for weapons. In fact, now that he thought about it, David was carrying a bronze sword as well. What was up with these teens and their bronze weapons? Tell me, what do you know about Greek mythology? Tyler asked, breaking Naruto from his thoughts. His question however, stopped Naruto in his tracks. Your mother was a great woman but even she had her quirks. She had a verbal tick and if she got excited and she would end her sentences with, databane, you got that from her. She even had a big obsession with Greek mythology. She couldn't get enough of it. She would read the stories to me almost every day and the way she talked about them, it was almost as though she thought they were real. His father had told him that in the rare occasions when Naruto had convinced him to talk about his mother. From what his father had said, his mother was borderline obsessed with Greek mythology and had a large collection of their books. Naruto himself had taken to reading his mother's old books as a way to connect with her. He had found their stories fascinating if not a bit disturbing at times. But he had noticed that with each story he read, he felt a part of him yearning for more. I've read my fair share of stories, what about it? Naruto answered honestly, and he felt anxious for Tyler's answer. That's good. It makes this a whole lot easier for all of us, Tyler retorted. Again Naruto paused as to what the boy meant as, us, he. Figured that he and David were in league but knew instinctively that he meant a lot more than he and David. Us, you mean there are more of you guys out there? Tyler gave him a grim smile and his eyes glazed over as he seemed to reminisce on something. He reached into his shirt and pulled out a small chain. It was made from string with what looked like camp beads attached. He fingered the beads and let out a wistful sigh. In that moment, Naruto felt like a voyeur peeking into a private moment. Yeah, there is a lot of us, he spoke, barely above a whisper. His eyes dimmed and his face seemed to age a couple decades before he spoke again. At least, there used to be until. 
He cut himself off before he said whatever he wanted to but Naruto could get the gist of it. Something had happened and this, group, that Tyler was a part of had lost a lot of their members. And he had the strangest of feelings that monsters like the one he had ran into were involved. An awkward silence settled between the duo as they trudged forward to meet up with David. During that time, Tyler occasionally glanced at Naruto through the corner of his eyes. The teen was only a bit shorter than he was and would easily pass as his half-brother on his godly side of the family. Despite the fact that he had just went head-to-head -head with a massive hellhound, he walked with every bit of confidence and grace one would expect from a seasoned demigod. Secretly Tyler smiled. It was clear that Naruto didn't know about the gods still existing to this day but he obviously had experience in fighting under his belt and could help out in their fight against the crooked one. With the prophecy just around the corner and Jackson away with his mortal friends, the camp would need every fighter they could get their hands on. Truly, camp morale was down with more and more of the campers leaving to join Chrono's side while the others that stayed were out fighting a war they didn't want, he tried. Not to think about all the things that were going wrong for them but the situation only seemed to worsen with each passing day. It seemed a whole lot easier to give up at this point. But what puzzled Tyler was how in the world Naruto had survived for so long. If he had to estimate, the boy was about the same age as Jackson so that meant his scent would be strong enough to attract monsters to his location. Sure he knew that some demigods scents weren't strong even to attract monsters due to their lineage. But with the large influx of monsters and Chrono's army quickly growing in size, the probability of any demigod not from Camp Half-Blood surviving for so long was one in a million. Boy, talk about luck. When they had finally caught up to David, Naruto was pleasantly surprised to see another person here waiting for them. She was propped up against the trunk of one park's trees and a small grimace on her face. Her left leg was wrapped up a makeshift bandage made from white cloth stained red. Her eyes met Naruto's wand she gave him a small wave. Her brown hair was disheveled and her green eyes held mirth despite her injury. She tried to stand but immediately went back down with a groan. Tyler rushed to her side and scolded her for her attempts. Naruto walked as Tyler undid her bandages to reveal a gash on her leg, just above her ankle. The girl only waved off Tyler's warnings. With a sheepish smile and contented to sit back and let him work, of course, Naruto was fascinated on what was going on and felt his curiosity spike when Tyler placed both hands above the wound and mumbled something Naruto couldn't make out from where he stood. In a moment, a light glow surrounded his palm and slowly but surely, the wound closed up. When Tyler made to stand he stumbled before righting himself. His skin was a tad paler and sweat beaded his forehead. Alright Katie, I did what I could do so don't try and aggravate the wound. Plus, David already called Chiron and he said that Argus is gonna be here in about half an hour to pick us up so just sit right there and rest. Tyler lectured the girl and she only nodded only before gifting him a brief, thank you. Whoa whoa whoa. Naruto exclaimed at his wit's end. First I'm attacked from some sort of monster only for it to be killed by you guys. Now, Blondie here has healing powers and some dude named Argus is gonna pick us up. Excuse me if I'm freaking out right now but I am confused, he ranted. Tyler chuckled for a good measure as he took in what Naruto had said. He had always loved to see how the newer demigods took in the news and Naruto's reaction was up there for the most hilarious. The thing is Naruto, you see all those Greek myths you've read about, they're all real. The gods. Zeus, Hera, Apollo and so forth, they still exist to this day. In fact, most of the world's biggest events have been due to their intervention. You're all delusional, Naruto deadpanned. There was no way in hell he would believe a word coming from their mouths. He may be a bit gullible at times but for them to think that he would even for a moment believe that the gods from Greek mythology were real, they had be smoking something. As soon as he was about to leave the three crazies in the park and head back home where things made sense, his father's words came back to him. She would read the stories to me almost every day and the way she talked about them, it was almost as though she thought they were real. Naruto's world flipped for a moment as he toyed with the possibility that the gods were real and Greek mythology was thriving. If so, does this mean that his mother had known about it all? And if she knew, did that mean she was once a member of whatever group? Tyler was a part of? And was this connected to him somehow? but all of those questions were shoved to the side by the one question he found himself asking inwardly. 
Just who was his mother really? Tyler must have caught the gist of what Naruto was thinking about by the sympathetic smile on his face. Naruto scowled at being read so easily. He never liked when persons were able to read his train of thoughts so easily. He sighed and raked a hand through his spiky blonde hair before deciding to humor their little theory. For now, at least. So, let's say I believe you about the whole Greek thing, where does leave me? What the hell are you guys? Naruto asked with a brow raised. This time, it was the girl who had answered him, Katie was her name if Naruto had heard right. She had pulled herself to her feet and approached him with a small smile on her face. Me, you, all of us here are what persons who call a half-blood. In the old days, the gods would oftentimes have affairs with mortals and their children would gain certain abilities or traits based on their lineage. The correct term for these persons is demigods and you are one of us, a demigod. No, you're wrong. My father is human. I'm positive about that, he said. What about your mother? Tyler asked and immediately regretted it when Naruto turned on him. She's dead. He snapped and would have probably slugged the boy for bringing it up if Katie hadn't placed a hand on his shoulders. Being so close to her, Naruto caught the faintest smell of strawberries and grapes. Her eyes were wide and despite the wariness beneath, they still held so much life that caused him to almost take a step back on reflex. Small smudges of dirt littered her cheeks that reminded Naruto of freckles. She's cute, he concluded, in an outdoorsy way. I know it's a lot to take in Naruto but your mother isn't dead. She might have disappeared but you need to understand that. Naruto brushed her hand off his shoulders. No, you're the one that doesn't understand. My mother is dead. She passed away 15 years ago in my father's arms. He buried her himself, she died. Suddenly he stopped before he said any more. There was no way he would say that out loud. No, those thoughts were never bespoken. She died during childbirth. She died because of me. Naruto took a deep breath to calm himself. His mother was a sensitive topic to bring up and made him emotional. I don't know what you guys think you know about me or my family but you're wrong. Katie herself was finding the situation harder to deal with. From what she knew, the gods and goddesses always disappeared after they gave birth. Never had she heard of a case where the demigod claimed to have buried their own parent. She placed her hand on his shoulder again and was pleased to see he hadn't brushed her off this time. Listen, I know this might be hard to believe but your mother is alive. She's most likely a Greek goddess and that would make you one of us, a demigod. Naruto's head swirled for the second time in a short span of time. This was the second time they had called him that, a demigod, and despite his mind's avid denial, his entire being shuddered in acknowledgement. He knew what the world meant. He wasn't human, or technically, he was only half human. And half God, his mind whispered. His mind was reeling with so many questions that. He stumbled backwards. How can you be so sure that I'm a demigod? Obviously, David had had enough of the conversation because he once again decided to butt in. Just accept the facts Blondie, you're one of us. If you weren't then that hellhound wouldn't have attacked you. Monsters only attack demigods because in their minds, normal humans aren't even worth the effort. So congrats kid, you've got a goddess for a mom, he drawled. Having said his piece, he turned away from the others. Tyler, seeing this as an opportunity, chose to speak again. It's obvious that today has been a long day for all of us. Katie, why don't you continue to explain the basic stuff to Naruto here while I contact Kyron and tell him that we have a new camper coming back with us, he suggested, getting a nod from Katie. He turned to David. And David, you can, continue doing whatever it is you're doing, he finished weakly as he watched the short boy pick at his teeth with a dagger. He sighed before walking off to send an iris message to Kyron. There would be a lot to explain. Naruto trotted over to Katie with a small smile on his face. Tyler had went off to contact someone in the woods although Naruto didn't know how while David stalked off to do his own the thing. The girl smiled at his approach and patted the spot next to where she sat. With both boys gone, the small clearing was silent and peaceful. He watched with avid fascination as the girl twirled the long blades of grass between her fingers and was shocked to see them respond to her presence. It was as if the grass became sentient when she touched them. How did you do that? He asked, breaking the girl from her actions. She sighed. I suppose you could say it's a gift from my mother, she explained. Narrowing his eyes in thought, 
he came up with another question to ask his new acquaintance. So you're saying that your mother, she's a... a goddess? She interrupted. She snickered when he nodded along sheepishly. While it could get annoying having to have to answer a... lot of questions when new demigods are found, Katie found Naruto likable enough that the nagging feeling of irritation faded away. Yeah, my mom's a goddess. She holds the seat of one of the Olympians, Demeter the goddess of harvest and agriculture, she explained. Naruto nodded and filed that information about the girl away for later. He could see where she could fit the bill of a daughter of Demeter. While he didn't understand the world of demigods, it wouldn't be wrong to assume that the children would inherit powers from the god that sired them. And seeing as though Demeter was indeed the goddess of harvest, she had to have some semblance of control over plants. This in turn explained how the grass blades had reacted to Katie's touch, no doubt having been affected by the girl's presence. So then, if your mom is Demeter, then who is my mother? Which goddess is she? Katie straightened and her lips set into a firm line. She failed to meet his eyes as she dug up an answer to his question but after a few moments, she deflated. We, we don't know. At least not yet, she tried to explain. The thing is Naruto, at this point, you're undetermined. That means we don't know whose godly child you are as yet. Naruto nodded along. That makes sense somewhat. After all, I'd only just found out that the mother I thought was dead is actually still alive. It wouldn't make sense for you to be able to find out who my parents are so suddenly, he reasoned. An awkward silence permeated between the two teenagers. Shuffling a bit, Naruto resolved to ask another question. So, this whole Greek myth thing. You know, the gods and stuff. How does it all really work? How is it that no one hasn't heard of them? He inquired. He had. Leaned in closer, his curiosity getting the better of him as he sought the answers. Katie had a small frown on her face as she contemplated on how to answer his questions. While she couldn't claim to be as smart as the kids in Cabin 6, Zeus knows how they would react if someone claimed to be as smart as them, she understood that she couldn't answer most of his questions with the war on the horizon. With the gods' horrible track record at parenting, it should have been obvious that most of the unclaimed demigods would hold grudges against. Olympus. Yet, they had been ignorant to that fact and had expected for all the members of the camp to fight for the parents that ignored them. So when Luke had began his recruitment for Kronos, many of the unclaimed demigods from the Hermes cabin had went missing, only to be found within the ranks of the Titan army. It was a huge blow to the camp and with the invasion on camp last summer using the labyrinth, camp morale had hit an all-time low. Most of the campers were preparing for war while the unclaimed demigods that had stayed were being ostracized by their peers, unintentionally driving them towards Kronos' side. It was shaping up to be a bad summer for the camp. Percy was still was in the mortal world with his friends while the other demigods were actively fighting against the various monsters that ran amok. The severity of the situation was so great that Chiron had cancelled most of the camp activities in favor of actively supporting the war effort. Normal classes were put on halt while the satyrs were recalled to camp, bringing recruitment down to zero. Hell, even the council of the cloven elders had fallen into shambles since Mr. D's recall back to Olympus. Glancing at the blonde next to her, she contemplated what his reaction would be if she unloaded all that information on him right now. Carrying him back to camp was basically asking him to fight a war he knew nothing about for a mother who apparently had abandoned him. She sighed. The life of a demigod was never easy. The mist takes care of that, she explained. At his confused glance, she elaborated. The mist is basically a magical force that disguises the supernatural. It's controlled by the goddess of magic Hecate, which she uses to twist your vision and causes mortals to see the gods and other divine objects as common day things. No one really knows how powerful it is but it's strong enough to make David's sword appear like a baseball bat to most mortals. That's why no one has heard of the gods. Heck, World War II was basically a war between demigods. She bit her bottom lip as another theory popped into her mind. Naruto, the mist also has the ability to warp someone's memories, she trailed off. Naruto for his part looked confused. He could understand the whole concept she was trying to bring across but hearing and seeing something in action were two different things. Honestly, he still wasn't fully convinced that this whole demigod thing was actually true and that the three teens had somehow escaped from some sort of asylum. Yet with each word she spoke, he found himself slowly 
leaning forward, not content with the bare minimum she was giving him. He could tell she was hiding something from him. Something huge most likely, and he was determined to figure it out sooner or later. This mist thing sounds powerful, he quipped. She smiled at him weakly, as though trying not to burst his bubble. Yeah, I guess it really is powerful, she swallowed, powerful enough to plant fake memories of your mother's funeral, she finished. Comma, 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 W what? I think that whatever memories you might have had about your mother's death was fake, Naruto. It was probably your mother's way to provide closure for your father. The thing is, gods aren't allowed to raise their demigod kids so they have to leave before we are born and this was probably your mother's way of covering her tracks. No, Naruto shouted. You're wrong. You have to be wrong, he vehemently denied. He had shot to his feet, garnering the attention of David who had decided to see how this would play out. Honestly, he didn't care either way. You have to understand that. Understand what exactly? Naruto shouted at the daughter of Demeter. Understand the fact that you're trying to imply that my mother's funeral wasn't even real. Or was it that all the pain that my father went through was because of some stupid rules made by the gods? Tell me Katie, what exactly is it that I should understand? It was at this moment that Tyler had returned. The blonde teen had just came back from his talk with Chiron, explaining to the camp director that they had found a demigod on their small quest. Walking a bit straighter, he closed the gap and stood between Katie and the new guy. He rose both hands in mock surrender and decided to be the peacemaker in the situation. Whoa whoa, why don't we all just take a deep breath and rein in our tempers first, he urged and was pleased to see them do as told. Good. Now, I know this is a lot to take in and you still haven't been told the whole lay of the land as yet but we have to get moving. Chiron said that Argus won't be able to reach us this far into the city so we have to meet him halfway there, so let's get a move on, Tyler explained. He turned to Naruto, I'm sorry but any questions you have will have to wait until we get back to camp. With four demigods in one area for so long, it's inevitable that more monsters will show up so we have to get a move on. Okay. Naruto nodded. That would suit him for now. Standing on the deck of the big house, Chiron looked out onto the camp he had resided at for decades. His brown eyes reflected the many years the peaceful centaur had lived for, seeing firsthand the fall and rise of many civilization. He was no stranger to war, having had witness and took part in more wars than he cared for yet each time he was forced to watch his precious students leave the camp with a chance of never returning, he felt a stab of pain in his heart. His job was horribly depressing in the worst moments but he wouldn't trade it for a thing in the world. He loved to teach, it was what he was born to do. His ears caught the small thudding of footsteps and soon enough, a camper made herself known. With a pair of worn blue jeans coupled with the orange camp shirt, the girl approached the camp director. With a friendly wave, Ah Annabeth, is there something I can do for you? He asked as the girl pulled up beside him. The senior counselor for the Athena cabin was at least two heads shorter than her mentor with golden locks then fell to her shoulders in princess curls. Her stormy gray eyes caught his and the girl took this as the initiative to speak. She walked in front of him before leaning against the railing on the deck. Some of the counselors were talking Chiron and they wanted me to ask if there was any word from Percy or at the least, any sightings of Luke. She asked with a small shrug, failing horribly to show her anxiety. Ever since the invasion most had dubbed as the Battle of the Labyrinth, Annabeth had taken it upon herself to help out the old centaur with camp activities, and with Dionysus gone, the help was much appreciated. But despite it all, he couldn't help but be concerned about her. He had known, or at the very least, speculated, about her role in the great prophecy and pitied the girl for the trials she would have to face. He knew about her feelings for Percy and Luke despite how much she denied it, and feared that what her actions would be if she were to choose between the two of her crushes. Truly, the fates must have become more cruel throughout the centuries to create such a destiny. I've yet to receive any word from Mrs. Jackson so it is correct to assume that Percy is not yet ready to return to camp, he explained to her while she frowned. And as for the situation with Luke, nothing new has been heard. With Poseidon at war with the Titan of the Sea Oceanus, no word has come in about the Princess Andromeda cruise ship. She straightened. I see. I'd hope that maybe, she trailed off. Thanks anyway. Chiron could hear the disappointment in her voice at the news. 
It was clear for most to see the feelings she held for the camp hero which clearly was reflected with the way she went about her business. Unlike most of the other campers who frequently went and came from assault quests to help disarray the Titan army, Annabeth had opted to stay and help the centaur in whatever she could. While that was one of her reasons for staying within camp borders, the other was that the girl had refused to go on a quest unless it involved Percy Jackson. The boy was her unofficial partner for quests and she refused to partner with anyone else. While there haven't been any news about Percy nor Luke, I was just contacted from Tyler from the Apollo cabin, he explained, dragging her from her thoughts. Their quest was a success and will be returning within the hour. It also appears that they have encountered an undetermined demigod who apparently knows about the war. Her eyes narrowed in suspicions. Are you serious? An unclaimed demigod outside of camp that isn't affiliated with Luke. Are you sure he isn't a spy for Luke? She asked while her fingers drummed against the railing she leaned against. Chiron took note of how her eyes darkened as though lost in thought and how she looked as though she was cycling through thousands of thoughts per minute. He sighed. It is unwise to assume the worst of him, Annabeth. They are still demigods despite the fact they have yet to be acknowledged by their parents, he chastised the girl and Annabeth had the consideration to look ashamed for her admission. However, he began, it is also unwise not to be be cautious with those we associate ourselves with. Taking in account the many betrayals. We've been faced with, the possibility of this new demigod being a spy have indeed crossed my mind. That is why I plan on having you keep a close eye on him when he arrives. Annabeth immediately protested, citing that she would be too busy to even consider taking on another responsibility. Chiron had at first urged her to reconsider but soon enough relented, opting to have one of the three members of the quest to fill the role of tour guide, chaperon. Exchanging pleasantries, both mentor and student remained on the deck until up at the top of Half Blood Hill a van with the sign Delphi's strawberries pulled up. After parking, five persons came out and made their way down to the big house, getting a small buzz from the campers passing by. Naruto had seen his fair share of freaky things in his time but this took the cake. He had been able to restrain himself from asking too many questions as Tyler had asked but he couldn't help but be curious. On the way to meet this, Argus, person the blonde archer had talked about, Naruto finally asked where they were going. Apparently, there was a camp at Long Island where demigods resided ebhind magical borders to Saudi safe. He had explained to the confused team that when a demigod discovered that he, she was a demigod, then their scent becomes stronger and draws in monsters. Like a moth to a cowl by that explanation, he had followed dutifully behind the trio. He had expected their escort to be a middle-aged man or something so imagined his surprise when a young man with many eyes pulled up. The man literally had so many eyes littered all over his body that Naruto couldn't keep count. Swallowing deeply, he allowed Katie to load him into the van while the others made small talk with the driver. The drive itself was smooth and about halfway thorough Naruto joined the conversatins. By the time they had arrived at Camp Half-Blood, as Tyler had told him it was called, he had learned that Tyler was a son of the Greek god Apollo while David was a son of the god of war Ares. He also learned that Argus worked for the camp, oftentimes in the infirmary or driving. Lost in his thoughts about his new life, he was unaware they had arrived until Katie roused his attention with a light slap to the wrist. Come on, let's get going, she said. Welcome to Camp Half-Blood. Annabeth would like to consider herself a good judge of character. She believed it was a trait she had gained from her mother and usually she would have been able to get the read on a person within the first few minutes of meeting them. Sure, she had been wrong. With her pick of first crushes, but to be fair, Luke was a nice and carefree guy up until that point when they had returned to his house and ran into Hermes. If she were to look back on it, Annabeth could distinctly point out that it was there that Luke had a massive change character. The once witty son of Hermes had slowly but surely transformed into a perverted shell of his former self. He began antsy and impulsive, having the tendency to pick fights they could have easily avoided in a vain attempt to vent or prove himself. But that massive blunder aside, she had not been wrong about her assessment about someone since. Which was why she felt like pulling the hair from her head when she had met the new demigod. Since the minute she met the boy, she could not for the life of her get a good reading on the boy. Everything about him was a polar opposite from the typical demigod. 
The first thing she was able to decipher was that the boy apparently did not have ADHD nor dyslexia. Sure, there was the occasional demigod, who either possessed one or the either but it was unheard of where a demigod had neither. It was preposterous. Another anomaly she found perplexing about Naruto was the fact that the boy had spent the last 15 years of his life without a single monster attack. Sure it was a well-known fact that there were many demigods sired by minor gods that lived in relative peace, but the key term in that term was relative. While compared to most godlings the attacks were far fewer, these demigods still attracted monsters like a beacon. The fact that Naruto had not attracted a single monster until today was unbelievable. Which made his arrival all the more suspicious. I have to say young man, your situation is indeed a rare case. Chiron's voice broke Annabeth from her thoughts. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first time I've ever heard of something like this, the immortal centaur commented with an echo of suspicion within his normal tone. Naruto for his part blushed slightly and scratched the nape of his neck while Chiron gave him another look over. I'm nothing special, Naruto muttered and Annabeth had to bite her tongue to stop herself from disagreeing. The blonde teenager looked rather plain looking in her opinion once you got past those weird markings on his cheek, yet he had proved to be anything but. He was an unknown variable, and the daughter of Athena hated unknown variables. They had a habit of derailing plans and she wasn't sure if this meant a good thing or a bad thing. But for now, she would step back and let things play out. If you say so child, Chiron spoke from his position. Turning his attention from the new demigod, the supervisor of the camp. Motion to the other campers that had been on the quest. I've already been informed on the happenings of the quest from Tyler and I must say, good work, to all of you. Now run along, I'm sure your respective counselors would love to hear about your success and safe return, he said before raising a hand in Katie's direction. All except you my dear. If you would, I'll need you to stay back for a while. Confused, Katie could only nod along while both David and Tyler went off further into camp with a grunt and a wave. Is there something I can do you for you Chiron? Take a seat, the both of you, the centaur instructed. When they complied, he continued, tell me Naruto, how much do you know of Greek mythology? Naruto straightened, I know a bit about it. My father had kept my mother's collection of books about ancient Greece and I would read them from time to time. Naruto answered and fought the urge to flinch when the blonde girl beside the man, um, horse. Hybrid. Narrowed her gaze. How someone could look her in the eye much. Less hold her gaze was a talent. Under her scrutiny, he felt naked and violated. You um, my dad said that my mom would spend hours just reading them to him, he continued. So am I to take it that your father is aware about your mother's godly status? Chiron inquired. No, he doesn't know. He was pretty shook up about her death, Naruto explained before he gained a pensive look. Excuse me um. Chiron. Whoa wait wait wait. Naruto leapt from his seat and pointed at the man horse like he had just discovered a huge secret. You mean to tell me that you're really the Chiron? Yeah, no, the guy who taught. Achilles and Hercules and those guys. In response, Chiron merely smiled and nodded along. Hua. Naruto exclaimed. Yes. Hua, indeed, Chiron commented, drawing snickers from the two girls and an embarrassed blush from the boy. Sorry about that but shouldn't you be, ya, yeah, no, well dead. Naruto asked, completely forgetting tact. I mean, in the myths, didn't you take that Prometheus dude's place in Tartarus or something? Chiron's eyes glazed at the mention of the word Tartarus and seemed lost in memories for a moment. Shaking off old ghosts. Chiron smiled yet this time Naruto felt his stomach sink at the action. It looked as though the immortal had aged a millennia in a matter of seconds. I don't know if I should be dead but the fact is I can't be dead. You see child, ages ago, the gods granted my wish. I had. Loved teaching and by the gods, as long as humanity need heroes, I'll be there to guide them to the destinies. But we're getting off topic, was there a question you wanted to ask me? Yeah. You see, the thing is, I haven't gotten the chance to tell my dad about all this and if I'm not home in time, I'm sure that he's gonna flip out. I see. No worries there child, I'll contact your father myself and explain it all to him, Chiron informed the boy. Are you sure? Yes child, I assure you, it will all be taken care of by the day's end, he promised. 
He switched to Katie, now Katie, the reason I asked for you to stay behind was to ask if you would take up the role of being Naruto's guide for the next few days, the camp supervisor asked. Sure, no problem Kyron. But what about my cabin, won't they need me? I'm sure Miranda wouldn't mind taking up the role of counselor, he commented then added on quickly at the girl's panicked look. Temporarily, of course, Katie sighed in relief. Sure thing, Kyron, she agreed. She grabbed Naruto by his arm and pulled him from his seat and off the deck. Before she could get too far, Kyron called out to her. And please Ms. Gardner if you could, kindly explain to our newest camper about our current situation. With both campers gone, Kyron had dismissed Annabeth for the morning and had retreated to his office to make good on his promise to explain the situation to the boy's father. With the phone in hand, Kyron found himself in a dilemma. He hadn't asked the boy for his father's number. Truly it was a honest mistake. The fact that he needed the man's number to be able to call him had slipped his mind. He was too consumed by the anomaly that was Naruto. Namikaze to truly think about that. I suppose I'll have to fetch the boy to get the number, he spoke to himself. Which was why he hadn't expected for someone to answer him. That will not be necessary, a soft voice spoke. It was soothing and silky which easily set the centaur at ease spinning on his heels or hooves to face the intruder he was immediately cowled and bowed quickly milady he greeted the woman the woman laughed it was soft and melodious rise my old friend there is no need following her instructions the immortal and rose and met the woman's gaze she was just as breathtaking as he remembered milady while your presence is not unwanted it is rare that you have made yourself seen unto us might i ask the reason he inquired in response, the woman smiled wistfully. My presence, dear centaur, concerns the boy you have welcomed to camp and the mortal you seek to speak to. Chiron eyes widened at the implications. D immortals, you're. Naruto's head was about to burst. So many things had changed in the last 12 hours that he felt that he was gonna wake up in his bed within the two-bedroom apartment that he lived in with his father. Even now, as he sat alone at the hearth that settled in the center of the cabins, information was still been processed. The fact that he wasn't even fully human was at the top of his mind. Sure Tyler and Katie had explained it to him as best as possible but some part of him had been rejecting the notion. It was just too, unreal. Yet here he was, in a camp for demigods. The tour had lasted about half an hour yet so much was covered. Apparently, each cabin was represented by a god on the Olympian Council akin to a mascot. Placement in cabins was sorted by whose child you were, and if your parents weren't a part of the council, then you placed within the confines of the Hermes cabin. But not only were demigods at the camp, but it chock full of satyrs and nymphs and naiads. The place was like a mythological wonderland, and Naruto swore that the tree spirits were mocking him by walking out from the trees only to scare the hell out of him. Sneaky little spirits. But that was all. No siree. What really took the cake was the fact that he had arrived when the camp was on the brink of war. A full-fledged, bloody war with the titans. He cursed whatever god it was that taught it was funny to do this to him. Before today, the worst Naruto had to think about was failing a test but now he was expected to stand up against a titan army. His life had went from zero to a hundred real quick. He had read about the titans from the books and knew just how vengeful and cruel the titans could be. Especially now that their king had risen from the depths of Tartarus to lead them in battle. So yeah, Naruto's head was about to burst. Night was quickly approaching and he could hear the low growls of the monsters in the forest. The other campers had quickly retired to bed with a quick warning not to be caught breaking curfew or the harpies patrolling the camp had free reign to do whatever the hell they wanted with him. From his estimation, he had about half an hour left before curfew and he intended to use it to get some fresh air and step away from it all for a while. Maybe even listen to the low cackling of the flame from the hearth or the soft humming from the girl beside him. Wait, girl. Surely enough, a girl had somehow appeared beside him. Beautiful hair as black as ink with style in ringlets fell to her shoulders. She was small, about nine years old and wore shawls to cover herself and a brown scarf wrapped around her shoulders. Yet, he was lost in her eyes. Eyes the warmest shade of brown he could imagine, he felt himself slowly leaning forward to share her warmth. The child didn't register his presence yet, tending to the flames of the hearth. With a small smile, 
She smelled of the smallest hint of toasted marshmallows. Being near her lulled his tensions and Naruto felt the urge to merely curl up at her feet and sleep in bliss. Licking his lips, he spoke up. HH hello, he spoke, stuttering over her words. The girl stopped her actions and turned towards him. His breathing stopped for a minute. Truly, the girl was beautiful and he instinct fully knew she would garner the attention of many when she grew older. Hello, she greeted back and smiled at him. He hid his blush by turning his head to the side. I'm Naruto, what's your name? He asked and the girl merely giggled. It was like the tinkling of bells. Swallowing his nerves, he spoke again. Don't you think it's a little late for a girl so young to be outside? What would your cabin mates think? He asked with concern for the girl. She tilted her head at him and giggled yet again. I could say the same to you, young demigod. Are you not supposed to be in your cabin as well? She asked and Naruto could hear small warning bells in his head telling him to be careful. It was the way she addressed him as, young demigod, as though she wasn't one as well. I should be but, he trailed off. Now the girl wasn't smiling, instead she had a small frown. Is there something wrong with your cabin? I would think you would be happy with the situation, after all, are they not family? Yeah, family. Right, Naruto muttered under his breath so the girl wouldn't hear but she heard nonetheless. That was yet another problem Naruto had with the camp. For the longest while, it was always him and his dad against the world. Now here he was with a camp full of teens claiming to be family and looking out for each. Other. He should be ecstatic but he wasn't. He couldn't describe how he felt about it at all. He guessed the news hadn't settled yet. He was sure about how he felt about his so-called family, he supposed. Don't be quick to judge what you've yet to fully understand, the girl warned. Perhaps it was his imagination but he could have sworn the flames got hotter for a moment. Give it time young hero. Give them a chance and I guarantee you'll see what I speak of. After all, when all else fail, family will always stand behind you. Naruto felt himself nodding along her words. She was right. It was unfair for him to judge them so soon. Thanks, he said. You know for a little girl, you're pretty smart tt ebayo. The girl smile returned yet again. Thank you, I'm glad to be of help, a loud screech interrupted what it was she was about to say. Frowning slightly for a moment before she smiled again, the girl returned back to tending the flames. You must leave now hero, the harpies are hungry and curfew is fast approaching, she warned. Checking his watch, Naruto realized she was right and ran off. Before he got far, he stopped and turned back to the girl to tell her to follow. Yet, when he turned around, she was gone and in her place was a small note with a message written in gold. Picking up the strang note, he read what it said. The hearth will always listen to those who sit by its flame. The hearth. Naruto thought before like a jigsaw puzzle it all came together. The hearth, the small girl, the flames. Oh. My. Gods. I just spoke to Hestia, the goddess of hearth, home and family, he said to himself, before he began to chuckle, no. Wonder why she didn't tell me her name. I just met a goddess. As he jogged over to the Hermes cabin, he swore he heard a soft giggle that sounded like the tinkling of bells. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next part.